Hi, everyone. This is Matthew Troy, music director and conductor for the Western Piedmont Symphony. And I'm so thrilled to be joined today by our two fantastic soloists for the Brahms Double Concerto. Our own principal cellist, Sam McGill, is joining us and also Misha Kalin, violinist extraordinaire. Um, and we're thrilled to take a deep dive today into Brahms's Double Concerto and discuss this piece uh, so that you, the audience, will know what to expect and have a few highlights to look forward to as you experience this performance. So welcome, both of you. It's so exciting to be uh, with you today and seeing you over Zoom. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Sure. My pleasure. So I thought we would talk just really briefly and introduce Brahms as a person in case people don't you know, know the name. I know Brahms is a very familiar composer to classical musicians, but he was obviously a German romantic composer and, you know, lived from 1833 to 1897 and was just a, a really um, incredible leading voice in German romantic music and certainly took took the torch uh, from Beethoven. Uh, our concert also features Beethoven's Fifth Symphony um, as well, so you'll understand that relationship between the two of them. But didn't know if there was anything that either of you would like to just share about your own, you know, perspective on Brahms, uh, his music, his him as a person, or any, anything to get us started today. Well, I guess um, I'm a little bit more fortunate enough as a violinist that I had this great composer also write a violin concerto for my instrument. It's uh, it's one of the milestones, uh, one of the just titanic works period for the violin as an instrument. And he, of course, wrote it um, in relationship to a man who I'm sure you're going to mention, uh, Joachim, who was a friend of his. He dedicated to him. Um, and be beyond this, I think if somebody wants to understand Brahms as a person, he was very frustrated with himself all his life and about his music. He never thought that many of his works were good enough. Part of it having been what you just mentioned, his relationship in lineage to Beethoven, because after Beethoven, it was so hard to measure up. And uh, sadly, also, he destroyed many, many works that he actually completed Brahms. Um, but we're lucky enough, there is a violin concerto besides incredible symphonies, uh, chamber music, I just, just Really, uh, the man was the epitome of romantic period and uh, piano music leader, just just everything. But um, it would have been nice if all the works that he composed were around, because uh, I think Brahms at his worst is probably uh, <laughs> many, many other composers trying to be at their best. I understand. So, I understand. Yeah, yeah that's I a lot of great, great info. Great info. So, yeah. Sam, anything that that you know comes to mind for you? Oh yes, of course. The fact that he did not write us as cellists a cello concerto is unfortunate for us. Uh, and ev evidently, when Victor Herbert's uh, cello concerto number no. two was given its world premiere in New York, um, Brahms. No, I'm sorry. Then Dvorak was inspired to write his cello concerto. And then when Brahms attended that, one of those concerts, um, he said, if I had only known what could be done with the instrument, I probably would have written it a concerto. But then he didn't live very much longer after that, so. Right, right. I'm always also intrigued by learning about the, the personalities of the composers as much as we can know, I guess, at this point, you know, these kind of small things, these idiosyncrasies um, about them as per people. He was, um, you know, a very handsome, striking figure when, in his younger days. It was commented on kind of his 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 handsome face, strong brow, uh, full head of hair, you know, um, but he was a little bit on the shorter side. And as he got older, became a little uh, more round and, and robust, I suppose. And but he he loved having a, a, a cold beer at the end of the day and a cigar at the end of the evening. And, um, you know, it's just fascinating, I think, to to humanize the composer a little bit and think about these these quirks. Apparently, he loved uh, carrying candy in his pocket and, and handing out candy to children in his in his hometown and um you know just these these things that kind of make them 
take them down off of the ivory pedestal a bit and, and kind of humanize them. Um, I always find so interesting. Apparently, he had a, an incredible wit and an incredible sense of humor uh, that could cut both directions, I suppose you might say. Um, he could be a harsh, harsh critic. And as Misha just said, he was a harsh critic of himself as well and a, and a critic of his own music. Um you know, in romantic music, in German romantic music, in music school, we often learned that there are kind of these two camps, right, where Brahms was the conservative composer, and then you had Wagner that was the more radical and uh, progressive composer. And to be honest, I've always struggled with that label a little bit. I mean, I certainly see the progressive side of Wagner's music uh, harmonically, but I just find the more I study Brahms's music and the more I perform his music, it's really hard for me to label it conservative um, because I think it's so incredibly constructed. The architecture in particular of his music is, is incredible and how he is able to generate entire works, entire symphonies, entire concertos out of the smallest seed of an idea and how his his mind can just invent so many different ways to interpret that. And so I, I don't know if, if if either one of you, you know, have anything to add or share about your experience as a, a performer of his music and how that approach may, you know, impact the way that you take on a piece like this. Well, I would say that um, I think that um, even though he's a, such a traditionalist, and using um, classical and Baroque um, musical forms. But what's underneath all that is so emotionally deep. Yes. And, um, and that's what where he rises above most of his contemporaries. And, um, uh, so, uh, and, and so I think, you know, he bends more, more modern harmonies with you know just deep emotional feelings so you don't really even notice i think is is whereas with wagner it's it's always present this intense chromaticism and yes yeah but um no brahms uses it for a different purpose yeah that's a great way to put it sam and and i love that you touched on that emotional depth because i agree with you it's it's like a well that you can just always go deeper into. It, it, you never quite hit the bottom with Brahms. There's always more emotional uh, depth to 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 get to. Um, Misha, anything you'd like to add on that? I think with a listener, especially um, when you listen to Brahms's music, you hear melodies, uh, of course, but the melodies never end. And for me, as a performer, I would interpret it in a different way, that the phrase never ends. Mm -hmm. That when you listen to a beautiful line of Mendelssohn or Tchaikovsky or Dvorak, you kind of have this, it's going from here to here. Well, Brahms, it becomes like a chameleon, a phrase. It's one phrase, you don't even realize that you already entered another, another dimension. And when you think, oh, I can relax, I can exhale, uh, there's no place to exhale because the next next mountain is be, being built. So I think that is the uniqueness of it and how it all blends in. It's just incredible. And uh, it, it's it's like um, Aurora at night. You cannot say where one color starts and where, where one color ends. And that would be for me as a performer, um, the most, and also listener that they just, it's a never ending story until the, the very end. <laughs> right. And so, you know, with, for, for the listeners that are classical music aficionados that might be watching this, do you think that Brahms gets that idea in any way from Schubert with these long, just long, never ending melodic lines? Uh, Misha, I don't know if you have an opinion on that or not. I think that would be a very a good example. However, Schubert, of course, did it on a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. It was not so heavily, uh, I don't want to use the word orchestrated, but when mm -hmm. I look even a violin sonata, I look at it 
you know, violin piano sonata, uh, even those little sonatinas, uh, there's always, you know, things happening there. And I think Brahms just takes it to another level uh, of the same, but that's basically what happens in composing, you know, from Bach. <laughs> you can even say Bach's fugue is yeah. inspired by Brahms because you have all these things that continuously go, you know, the, the, and I'm sure you can say uh, things, you know, it, it's kind of, there's a lineage, but I just think that Brahms, yeah, it, it really, re, uh, Wagner is also great, you know, example of, of that, but in a diff, I completely agree with Sam that it, it's a much more spread out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, it might be a little bit off topic, but you know, it just, it, 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 talking about the things that you, we've just touched on, uh, Brahms also loved the the voice. He wrote a lot for the voice. Wrote many many great German songs. Um, but it's very interesting to me that he never decided to tackle an opera. And um, he wrote great choral works. Um, but it's it's just interesting to me. In some ways, I think it speaks to that emotional depth that Sam is talking about. That's just so latent in the music itself, where. Um, maybe he just didn't feel the need to portray things in those dramatic terms, but he was such a musician's musician, if you will. Um, and I've always just been drawn to his music for that reason. And of course, Sam, with your huge uh, career as an opera cellist at, at the Metropolitan Opera, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on why Brahms maybe never found himself writing an opera. I feel like his... I feel like he's he was too much of an intellectual in a way mm -hmm. to um not that it, not that you know it, it doesn't take uh great skill and intelligence to write an opera it's just that I don't think his type of music um lends itself yeah I agree. to that kind of hyper emotional it's more much more contained Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have been comfortable with that. I agree. Yeah, it's a deep it's it's a different type of emotion. It's not an it's not an outward emotion as you're saying like with a lot of flash that's not Brahms's music but it's a really intense kind of inward looking emotion and I think that's where you really find the depth in his music and that's what makes this concerto so special as well. And also um Schubert wrote a number of operas, but they weren't successful because, well, partly the librettos apparently were quite bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the stories just don't work, but also he doesn't have a sense of the dramatic either. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a German thing, sort of, I don't know. Yeah, you said, uh, Sam, if I may, when you say the, uh, the libretto was not dramatic enough, probably nobody died. So <laughs> Schubert tried to do the clean version, you know, the, the diplomatic version of the opera. But if nobody dies, it's not interesting, right? It's not an opera if nobody dies. So I think he wrote an opera called The Magic Harp. Wow. Which I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't yeah. see how you're going to bring that thing onto the stage and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, let's dive in a little bit and talk about the concerto. Uh, Brahms is, you know, all around me today. You can see over my shoulder here. I've got a, a portrait that hangs in my office of Brahms. And I also have this amazing uh, copy of, this is a facsimile of Brahms uh, third symphony in his <clears throat> own handwriting. And it's just an amazing thing to reference. And it, the third symphony was written just a few years before the double concerto and so looking at his handwriting and looking at things you can really get a sense of how he worked through his music and and how he expressed himself in music so the concerto came about because uh, he was friends with many of his famous contemporaries of the day he was had a lot of great friendships with different musicians of the time and one of those was the famous violinist Josef Joachim who was a dear friend of his, as Sam, uh, as Misha just referenced about the, the violin concerto. And I guess there was a falling, Joachim and his wife went through a rather public and messy divorce. And some of the friends ended up on one side and some friends ended up on the other side. And 
so uh, there was kind of something that that experience severed the relationship between Brahms and Joachim for a while. And this piece helped bring them back together. And so I think this piece was in a way an olive branch that Brahms was offering to Joachim to reestablish their friendship. And uh, that's just such a, a an interesting angle and maybe a good jumping off point for, for how we start talking about the concerto specifically. Uh, I guess uh, one interesting fact about this piece is uh, as I, when I spoke to Sam, uh, regarding, you know, which edition he uses, you know, because we we do a lot of prep work before we show up for the first rehearsal. I think uh, what's important for the audience to know, uh, as a maestro, as a conductor, you have to deal with, you know, the soloist for the concerto. Here you have to deal with two people. <laughs> and I think Sam and I need to be on the same page when we come to you, because if two of us have different ideas, then you have to figure out you you you'll have to become the Joachim. Which side are you gonna take? Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna go with Sam or Misha? No. Uh, but it, it, in all seriousness, this is really his last orchestral work. Yes. And when speaking to Sam, come back to what I was initially saying. To me, it almost feels like he wanted to write the, a fifth symphony because the work is so symphonic. Mm -hmm. Um and. And it's it, large. It's a it's a long work and large in scope, like it, a symphony. It, it's like a Titanic work. Yeah. That's the. I mean, it's like a large ship that at any point can go down. Um, but it's so well written. But I would have to say that um, as a violinist here, uh, it's very challenging. It's very challenging because you are. This is not a nice concerto between the two soloists. It seems like they're. There's a lot of tension between the cello and, and the violin. And I think what one thing needs to be very clear, whatever it, the idea is perceived by the performers and the conductor, um, it needs to have a very large edge to it, meaning that the dramatic scale of this work is so vast. Whereas if you compare it to another great work that some of uh, the audience may know, Symphony Concertante by Mozart. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, it's sweet. Everybody's enjoying the sunny day, some of the most wonderful melodies. This has wonderful melodies, but they come with a lot of big baggage. <laughs> so I think when uh, listeners listen to it, they really understand that this, just look at that dr dramatic beginning. Uh, the okay. very beginning of the piece, it really sets you up and and really you're walking to a fire and, and you have to survive it, both as a performer and as a work of uh, having everybody on the same page. Sam, I, I'm sure you must have something to add about kind of that that friction, that tension between the different solo voices and and kind of. What does that represent? How does it how does it impact you as a, a player and someone who has to interpret the work? Um, I well, I would say that um, clearly it's not just up to me to as to how it's um, interpreted. So it has to be obviously, like you said, a collaboration. Um, very much so um, because we share all the all the melodies, right? I mean, it's yeah, pretty much, and. Um, um, uh, there was there was something I now I've forgotten what it was I wanted to oh I know um, I don't know I told Misha this already last week but um, many people might remember the slow movement that's the middle movement as being the that was the theme song for a long running soap opera in the sixties called the Secret Storm and so it would show these crashing waves you know and then the then the Brahms double concerto starts and it's very dramatic and grand and so that's what people used to think of it as wow i i think i've missed that reference but that's uh i'll have to catch up on my 60s soap operas that's maybe right. after the maybe after the concert week but uh <laughs> gives me a new project sam so <laughs> thanks thanks for sharing that <laughs> Well, um, Misha, you also touched on kind of the, the technical challenges presented in the piece. Uh, I mean, earlier in the discussion today, we talked about the, the violin concerto. 
another mm-hmm. just massive gargantuan piece of music. Uh, the piano concertos are both huge in scope. Um, and and so he obviously liked writing in these larger forms, but that means it really turns, you know, these performances for you as a soloist and Sam as well. I mean, these are these are kind of marathons that you have to run. You, there's a stamina. There's a there's a, a very much a physical demand uh, placed on you to really communicate this music. So maybe both of you could just speak about the unique and different challenges that Brahms presents to to you and your instrument. Sam, I'm going to ask you a question, point blank. How comfortable is it for you to play your part? Hardly at all. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing for me. And the, the only thing I have to say to um to put some color to this is I actually believe it or not, Matthew, I am also privileged enough to have one of the 500 limited copies that were produced of the violin concerto, the facsimile. Okay. Yep. Uh, because when uh, Fritz Chrysler, a very famous violinist passed away, he had that and he bequeathed it to the Library of Congress with an agreement that they make it public. Well, they did, but they only did 500 copies of it. Mm-hmm. What's really fascinating about that is that in that score, you actually know which hand is in which color, meaning when it was being written, you see some markings by Joachim, suggestions to Brahms because Brahms was a pianist he was not a string player right and we have a composer so voluptuous as Brahms with his phrasing and everything and him being a pianist he needed some guidance to know what a violinist can do and cannot do because so is the cellist as a string player so here it's interesting there is no facsimile and you wonder how much guidance was given to this piece because some of these things are just very uncomfortable to play. However, musically, they're just sublime. Right. And so just for our audience, they're uncomfortable primarily because of, how, how would you describe it? Maybe the, the particular, what key areas he tends to write in, um, in terms of the finger patterns and thing, things that don't feel so comfortable in the hand or often the gesture uh, these wide leaps sometimes or big jumps and things that are e- much easier to conceptualize on a piano when you think about it rather than on how it might be executed on a violin or uh, my goodness, especially a cello. Uh, Sam, I'd love to hear your thought on kind of what is it that makes it feel uncomfortable in a way? Oh, well, he places great technical demands on uh, the cello the cellist, that's for sure. I mean, just in the very opening statement by the cello, you've got, um, you know, a crazy octave with your thumb that comes just out of nowhere. You have to somehow figure out a way to get there and play it in tune, hopefully. And, um, oh, it, and th- it, this just happens over and over again. And also, he wrote, well, as high as anybody ever wrote at that time yes. for the cello. So high C, mm-hmm. uh, not off the fingerboard, but close to the edge. <laughs> so, and, and that, and huge leaps. Like, yeah, and there are moments even where the cello occasionally even is orchestrated above the violin, yeah. which is another interesting color. And again, a, an interesting technical demand that you have to negotiate as a player. Um, Misha, you look like you're about to say something, so I want to give you the opportunity to, to... more more worried about performing this piece. Sam, you're you're beginning to scare me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> well, we played it before, so no. Uh, but That's... really, it is it is a challenge. This is not one of those pieces that you kind of learn, put away, and somebody calls you up. Can you play it on a one day's notice? No, I mean yeah. you really need to um retrain physically physically because you know when we perform on any instrument let it be a trumpet let it be a trombone violin or cello the audience want to hear the final product they don't care how complicated it is yeah. how much you needed to work on it of course you also want to play something with substance uh, and brahms fits substance very well but especially in this concerto 
uh, just for string player, just in a lot of chamber music, Sam, right? I mean, the the some of the piano quartets, uh, the melodies are great, but getting getting to have them heard very well takes a lot more physical toll, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important because you do want to play in tune, you want to play the right notes, and of course, you want to play the music way. Yeah. So the concerto is written in three movements, kind of standard form. Uh, the first movement's in a very predictable form overall, but it does have some interesting um, things that make it unique to this concerto. Like Sam just mentioned, you have a, a very brief orchestral introduction and then immediately into this extended cello cadenza uh, at the beginning. The second movement is a beautiful kind of song form, beautiful melodies, and then you get to the finale, this rondo form, which is the rondo is this idea that keeps coming back around. Uh, so the audience begins to kind of get that into their ear a bit and, and you can start to anticipate when the rondo comes back around. It has a slightly Hungarian kind of feel to it, which is somewhat typical for Brahms, I think. But um, anything that jumps out at you about either the finale or just the overall form in terms of um, uh, listening to the piece, because again, I, I think it's always important to realize as an audience member, they have to absorb all of this at one time in a live performance. And so I think anytime we can point out, this is something important to listen for or to think about, I think it helps inform their, their listening experience. So Sam or Misha, e either one of you who wants to tackle that one. Uh, the last movement has um, not only this, it starts, it starts off with the cello again, um, very in a very light-hearted vein, and then and but then it doesn't take long before it um, again becomes deeply serious um, with the with the uh, secondary melody, I guess you'd call it. Um, it's so noble and absolutely amazing. So that's my observation would be for the listener to think of it because it's so beautifully orchestrated mm. uh, that Sam's part is like cello two and my part is like violin three because it is so well-rounded uh, the way it's written that it's not when Sam and I come in and play our melodies that everybody just backs off. No, no, the first violins wanna use their elbows, shove in there. You hear the, the, the brass get in there. And we're really, it's only one of each, Sam and me representing our own sections, whereas the first violins have quite a few more people than us. So it really is, you know, the word concerto means harmony, to bring into agreement. Well, this is like agreement on a very big scale. Imagine we're trying to balance the budget of the United States government. <laughs> and everybody wants a little piece of, uh, of money going their way. It's on the biggest scale you can imagine, this piece. All right. Yeah, this I think we've covered a lot of incredible ground on the piece um, and, and introduced it hopefully in a way that adds to the experience for our audience. We have the third Brandenburg Concerto of Johann Sebastian Bach to open the program. And then we close the concert with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So this is truly a concert of the three Bs of German romantic or German classical music, I should say. Um, and, and really, I think following the, the trajectory of how each of these important Germanic composers influenced one another um, and, and how they led to just the development of this amazing music that we're still uh, so lucky to be able to perform today. Any closing thoughts from either of you about anything um, programmatically or, or anything else on the concerto you'd like to add before we wrap up today? Well, I just think it's so great that Misha and I finally have a chance to play it again. I, 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 I'm not really exactly sure what, which year it was, 2001 maybe? Perhaps, yes, around there. Yeah, so that's quite a while. It is, so, this is like a coming together of, of old friends again. It's great, it's yeah. so great, yeah. But so much music has been made in between, so it'll be interesting for us as people that, you, you know, musicians, we never play the same concert performance uh, twice. We're human, we're not AI. Yeah. And it'll be interesting how much we have changed uh, progressed or maybe got new ideas and that's that's the beauty of music that here we are you know 20 years plus later we get to play this music and I do not know 
if Sam will disagree with me in any way, but in these years, this piece has even grown more on me as, as a great monumental work that, that just is so awe it's inspiring. I think that's true of Brahms' music in general. I think the longer you spend with it, the more you get to know it, the more you can really appreciate it on a, on a deep level. So um, it's been a really a treat and a thrill to talk to both of you today. I'm so excited about the concert. It's coming up on November 9th, Saturday. Uh, on the with the Western Piedmont Symphony, you can get tickets at wpsymphony.org, um, and we're just thrilled to to bring both of you together for this incredible concerto. So thank you so much for your time today, and uh, I hope everyone will join us at the concert. So thanks, everyone. Thank you too, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.